Okay, here we go. I believe this is the fourth session of Just This, Richard Rohr, and uh, glad that you're all here. And any of you who are watching the recording, Allison, if you, uh, Allison said she would definitely watch after she took care of her daughter's lice. Always something going on with kids. We're going to start on page 12 today. This is still the introduction. It's called the log removal process. So we started off with his um, few pages on awe and surrendering to it, where he was talking about the, the necessity for us being able to let our moments stun us, let our moments put us into that place of awe, which only happens when we're looking at our moments with beginner's mind, only happens when we get all the preconceptions out of the way and we're able to just see what's there. And it can be the tiniest thing that just rivets your attention the tiniest thing that just moves you into gratitude and, and awe as if you never saw that thing before, even though you're completely familiar with it. It just doesn't matter. It's the Brother Lawrence School. So that's where he's starting with. And then he moves into what does the process look like for removing the log in the eye? What does the process look like for being able to strip down back to beginner's mind, where we're really looking at the child's eye? So um, this is what we're heading into next. Before we dive into the text, was there anything anybody needed to discuss from last week or any of your intervening days? I don't think I have what you're... Uh, no, you don't. Do. You don't have the book. So just follow along. Just listen, because we're going to read everything. Okay? Great. All right. Okay, so let's start on page 12. And we, I wanted to, to read a little bit more. I'm not going to read the whole section because it's about five pages, but I'm going to read the first couple of pages and then we'll go back and dissect just so we get more of the lay of the land. All right. So we've got the log removal process. He writes, if my description of the foundational path of awe and surrender strikes you as possibly true, I must repeat that we are usually blocked against both of them just as we are blocked against great love and great suffering. Early stage spirituality was largely about identifying and releasing ourselves from these blockages by recognizing what an unconscious reservoir of expectations, assumptions, and beliefs we are already immersed in. If we do not see what is in our reservoir, we will understand all new things in the same old pattern way, and nothing new will ever happen. A new idea held by the old self is never a really new idea. Whereas even an old idea held by a new self will soon become fresh and refreshing. Okay. Contemplation actually fills our reservoir with clean, clear water that allows us to encounter experience free of old patterns. That allows us to encounter experience free of old patterns. That's what it says. Here is the mistake we all make in our encounters with reality, both good and bad. We do not realize that it was not the person or event right in front of us that made us angry or fearful or excited and energized. At best, that is only partly true. If you let that beautiful hot air balloon in the sky make you happy, it was because you were already predisposed to happiness. The hot air balloon just occasioned it. And almost anything else would have done the same. How we see will largely determine what we see. And whether it can give us joy or make us pull back with an emotionally stingy and resistant response. Without denying an objective outer reality, and that's important, without denying mm -hmm. an objective outer reality, what we are able to see and are predisposed to see in the outer world is a mirror reflection of our own inner world and state of consciousness at that time. Most of the time, we just do not see it all, but rather operate on cruise control. Jesus, of course, was talking about this phenomenon in his famous line about calling out the speck in another's eye and not recognizing there was actually a log blocking our own. He taught this with great emphasis. Hypocrite. Take the log out of your own eye first, for only then can you see clearly enough to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Our Buddhist friends have long called the log removal process lens wiping, 
And I suspect it was exactly what Jesus was referring to when he told us to change. Okay. Any thoughts or first reactions before we go back and dissect it? I'm looking forward to um, dissecting it. Well, then wait no longer. Here we go. If my description of the foundational path of all in surrender strikes you as possibly true, I must repeat that we are usually blocked against both of them, just as we are blocked against great love and great suffering. Okay, so here are these blockages. Why do, do you think, and we'll just kick this around just a little bit, why are we blocked against great love? It's obvious why we're blocked against great suffering, right? But why do you think we're blocked against great love? He's holding that up as being the same as being blocked in the path of awe and surrender. Why would we be blocked against great love? It's risky. Ooh, ah. It made when, when we had loved before, we got hurt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? I mean, they're hitting the nail right on the head, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. There is a common denominator yeah, common denominator be both, between both great love and great suffering that makes them both very risky. Any thoughts on that? What's the common denominator? Pain. I'm sorry? Pain. Well, great love doesn't have great pain at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Fear of end up, yeah, with pain. But, I'm sorry? Fear of commitment. Fear of commitment. Well, that's more of a, an effect rather than a cause, I would think. Yeah. Deeply uh, feeling. What's that, Sharon? Deeply feeling. Okay. We're, we're, we're kind of zeroing in on the word I'm looking for. Okay. I have, being, a, I have a very... Being cool. known. Being known. Okay. Okay, I, I, I cannot put any words, but I have a very concrete example. My um, Now, my daughter, when she was in high school, she had agriculture. One of the projects is to raise a pig. The pig is not meant to be a pet. The pig will be sent to a slaughterhouse. Uh, I, I don't know how much she is aware of that. And so she wants to call the pig cute names, Hamilton. Hamilton was big at that time. And I said, this is not a pet. And I didn't want her to have falling in love with a pig. It was a cute little piglet, very cute. And actually they're intelligent because you look at the pig, they make good eye contact with you. And you know, this is a sentient being, very cute. And I did not want her to fall in love. I said, no, you, you know, it's up to you, but don't name the pig Hamilton, you know. And yeah, of course, at the end, it made delicious pork chops. <laughs> I mean, really, it was the juiciest, tender, yeah. Ellen, Ellen, my cousin named his two piglets in 4-H, Sizzle and Lean. Oh, my gosh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this oh, one, this that's one was just Hamilton. perverse. Yeah, she but I love it. Hamilton for ham, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not sure she was aware oh. of the significance in um, Oh my God! Would she me. eat the meat, um, Ellen? Because um, my kids, when we went to <laughs> ag for you know to go to the fair for judging and everything, they wouldn't eat it. Uh, nope. uh, she she did because it smelled delicious. It was made into chorizo. It was made to pork chops. It was made to this and that. Yeah. All right, time to start raining so, it back great, in again. Great love and yeah. suffering. <laughs> so we're, we're, I would say, I was thinking, I was we're thinking off. to me, a sense of powerlessness. When you're in great love, when you're in the throes of that love, there is this sense of, you know, not always grounded, you know, in a sense of, I don't know if it's powerlessness or what, but it's um, kind of, I guess for me, it's not feeling in control. That's it. I mean, Danielle's right on. I mean, all of you are, are veering in. The word that I was looking for was vulnerability. 
the powerlessness okay. works too. As soon as you yeah. fall in love with whether it's a pig named Hamilton, it's another person, <laughs> it's your children, you your heart is out a mile. Someone someone once said, um, you know, to love to be a parent is to live with your heart outside your body. I thought that's pretty good, right? Because you are completely exposed, you are vulnerable, you are powerless, and it's a scary place to be. Um, because you know that eventually the great suffering is going to come because everything changes. And so the we have in great love and great suffering, great vulnerability, and we fear the vulnerability. So we protect ourselves. And especially as I think Ellen or somebody said, you know, once you've been hurt, you know, then you're going to protect yourself even more. And so it's the vulnerability that does it to us, that sense of being out of control, that sense of being powerlessness. We fear that. And so we resist both great love and great suffering. And yet it's only through the vulnerability that we're ever going to get where we want to go. I mean, it, it is it is so paradoxical that the very thing <laughs> that will take us into complete connection, the unity, meaning, purpose, identity, everything is being blocked by our fear of the vulnerability that will take us there. But that's the human condition. That's why Jesus teaches the way he does. That's why he's always using paradoxical language, because until we figure it out that this is the paradox and we have to live the paradox, um, then we're never really going to get where we want to go. So that is usually blocked. The, the great, the path of awe and surrender, if you think that he's right, is going to be blocked the same way we block and resist great love and great suffering. And he says early stage spirituality is largely about identifying and releasing ourselves from these blockages by re recognizing what an unconscious reservoir of expectations, assumptions, and belief we are already immersed in. So I wanted to take a, a little sidebar here. I'm going to share a, share a screen because all that he's talking about here are often called core beliefs. And I don't know if you've heard that phrase before. Core beliefs, but here we go. What are core beliefs? Can you all see the screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Core beliefs are a person's most central ideas about themselves, others, and the world. These beliefs act like a lens through which every situation and life experience is seen. Because of this, people with different core beliefs might be in the same situation, but think, feel, and behave very differently. Even if a core belief is inaccurate, it still shapes how a person sees the world. Harmful core beliefs lead to negative thoughts, feelings, and behavior, whereas rational core beliefs lead to balanced reactions. So here's some examples that they're going to give. Situation, two people with different core beliefs receive a bad grade on a test. Okay, person A, the core belief is, I am a failure. So that was going to be installed in that person probably in childhood. And so the reaction is, first of all, what they're thinking is, of course I failed, why bother? The feeling they're going to have is depression. The behavior is that they're not going to make any changes because why bother? It's not going to make any difference. I'm a failure. Now, they're not thinking I'm a failure. That's not conscious. I'm a failure is unconscious, very deep down. What they think here is, of course I failed, why bother? Just because the core belief is what's driving the bus. That's the, that's the key. What's unconscious is really driving the bus in terms of thought and behavior patterns. We think we have control with our minds, but we really don't. Person B, their core belief is I'm perfectly capable when I give my best effort. So their thought is I did poorly because I didn't prepare. They feel disappointed, um, but then they plan to study before the next test. Common harmful core beliefs. Core beliefs are often hidden beneath surface level beliefs. For example, the core belief no one likes me might underlie the surface belief that my friends only spend time with me out of pity. So that's what you would consciously be saying, but beneath that is going to be that no one likes me. So there's uh, core beliefs around helplessness. I am weak. I'm a loser. I'm trapped. I'm lovability. I'm unlovable. I will end up alone. No one likes me. Worthless. I am bad. I don't deserve to live. I'm worthless. External danger. The world is dangerous. People can't be trusted. Nothing ever goes right. You see how our experiences, both in childhood and traumatic experiences later, are going to create those core beliefs in us. What are the consequences? Interpersonal problems, difficulty trusting others, 
feelings of inadequacy in relationships, excessive jealousy, overly confrontational or aggressive, putting others' needs above one's own needs. That can be kind of a codependent type of relationship. Mental health problems, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, difficulty handling stress and no self-esteem. And then a couple of facts that they lay out. People are not born with core beliefs, they are learned. So we're born with beginner's mind, we're born as a tabula rasa and a blank slate, but we learn these things pretty quickly in childhood. Core beliefs usually develop in childhood or during stressful or traumatic periods in adulthood. Information that contradicts our core beliefs is often ignored. I mean, truthfully, we can't even process it because we don't realize the filter that we have unconsciously. And that filter is only let in, letting in to our conscious mind what we already believe. And so any new information that contradicts that, well, it doesn't make it through the filter. And so it's ignored. Negative core beliefs are not necessarily true, even if they feel true. And they always feel true. Core beliefs tend to be rigid and long-standing. However, they can be changed. But since they were they were forged in us through experience, the only way they're going to be changed is also through experience. It's going to be through doing, not just through thinking. Even when we uncover our core beliefs, either through therapy or contemplative practice, nothing changes until we act on what we have come to understand. In other words, awareness and opposite action. When we do the opposite action, when we do the opposite of what we're being triggered to do by our core beliefs long enough, then we create the new mental framework, literally new neural pathways. So this is so important to understand and that all of us have core beliefs. The negative ones are limiting us, the positive ones are taking us further forward, but we've all got a mix down there of something. And uncovering them and realizing they're there is the first step. And then acting on them. You know, it's like talk therapy uncovers them, cognitive behavioral therapy works them out, or dialectical behavioral therapy. In contemplation, it's the sitting through your 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 centering prayer or your meditation, your practice of mindfulness that starts to bring these up into the consciousness, and then it's the, the practice. Of, of mindful presence that is going to erase them. So it's the same thing here. This, and the two can obviously work really well together. But I wanted just to make sure that we really understood as best as possible, you know, what's at issue and what's working behind the scenes on our practice. Questions, comments on any of that? I do. I have a comment. Um, sure. When you talk about the um, common harf, you know, harmful core beliefs, um, like when I was a young, young boy, um, up until probably my sophomore year of high school, I was bullied a lot and I, I couldn't stand, I couldn't stand up for myself. And so I felt weak, a loser trapped, right? I, I really experienced most of everything on that line and it wasn't until um, I went into college that I started to learn that I was worthy, that I was intelligent, that I could set goals and achieve those goals. But it, it wasn't easy. It took me many, many years, got into my adult life, that I could see that in myself, that I was okay, that I was good. All of those things. Uh, you know, and it, it didn't free me from those things completely, but it made my life a lot more um, manageable in terms of my self-worth, um, how I perceived myself, how I thought other people perceived me. All of it was untrue. You know, when I was young and got bullied and felt like I couldn't stand up for myself, I took it all on as true. And it wasn't. And once I could get past that, it allowed me to be successful, right? It allowed me to, um, you know, have a lot of more meaningful experiences. It allowed me to trust myself as well as uh, not being defensive in terms of people 
talking to me, criticizing me. It got to a point where it's okay. That's your opinion. It may not be that of myself, but I trust myself and what I know about myself that people can't move me into that space again of, you know, unloved, you know, a loser, all of these kind of things. So, you know, I can relate to that. that that's, that's, thank you for that. Do you remember what were the first things, you know, either events or, or processes that allowed you to start questioning your core beliefs? What was the beginning of it? Did you do therapy? Was uh, was it your, your Buddhist tradition? What, what was it that's allowed you to start the process of questioning? <laughs> I've done a lot of therapy. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah, but but actually, um, I guess when I got into college, I was seventeen, right? And and I was still wet behind the ears, but I I was open to hearing and learning things that I hadn't thought about before. You know, I, I got to explore my my belief structure. You know, I got to look at how uh, my my beliefs, you know, about feeling uh, inadequate and how that was stopping me to really achieve and really believing that that, um, you know, I could be more than that. And so I did. I spent a lot of time in my early years just, you know, I worked on that a lot and I could I had to prove to myself that I could move beyond that so yeah and I did a lot of therapy I've done a lot of therapy dealing with that good great so there, there's a case in point for all of this any other thoughts I think for some people it might be difficult to get out of that trap because let's say Oh yeah, I'm a failure, and then people will tell them, "No, see, you can do this," and and they did do it. But then a week later, they didn't do they didn't do so well. So, see, there you go. I knew it. I am a failure. So it kind of negated, you know, the validation or the confirmation. And so there's that trap. How does one get out of that trap? And, and that's what we're talking about. You see, here's the, here's the key. The real the reality that we believe is the reality we endure, and we we believe unquestioningly our unconscious core beliefs because we don't even know they're there. We don't even know they're in operation. That's just the way things are. That's just the air we're breathing. So it's not until our awareness gets to the point that we can actually question whether. The, the thought and behavior patterns that we're so familiar with that keep coming back all the time are really true or not. You know, it's kind of like Paul when he said, you know, I don't know why I keep doing the things I don't want to do and the things I don't want to do, I keep doing. Remember when he goes into that rant and he ends up with what a wretched man I am? What he's talking about is fighting the core beliefs. Why does he keep doing the things that he knows are not profitable, that don't take him where he wants to go, but yet he keeps doing them. And the things he wants to do, he resists. This is what we're talking about. This is the resistance. It's at that unconscious level. And until it comes up to the conscious level, we're powerless against it. There's that word again. We're vulnerable to just keep repeating the knee-jerk stimulus response actions. But notice when Paul gets to the end of his life in Philippians and he says, I have learned to be content in all my circumstances. So he got over the hump. And so that's the question. What is it that's going to be the impetus for you to start questioning what you haven't even thought to question yet. You know, with Tony, it sounds like it was a combination of therapy and experience that he was having as he continued on in college and, and in life. For me, it was definitely contemplation because I didn't do therapy. I should have, but I didn't. You know, for all of you, <laughs> what was what was the combination? What, what, or what was, what was the impetus? How have you gotten as far as you've gotten? And just like Tony is saying, it's not that, you know, we're 100% now. I mean, I know that I still have core beliefs down there that are working me. But when they do it, I can become aware that it's back in place again, that I'm being triggered to old patterns, and then I can come around and come back. So it's that 51% again. Can we at least get to the point where we are now characterized by something different? And that process will keep working as long as we keep working the process, which is awareness, of course, staying aware.
and where why we're choosing the things we choose and doing the things that we do. But it has to start someplace. This process he's talking about of contemplation, of, of becoming aware enough to let your moments really stun you and awe you and surrendering to that is the process of becoming more and more aware of what's really going on so that we can make different choices. You know, one thing that's interesting is that now in, you know, in my daily life, there's times where I think, you know what, Tony, you're not creative. You know, you know, there's not a creative bone in your body. Okay. In my heyday, in my profession, I've won an Emmy in design. Not too many people do that. But I still, get, even today, I, there's times where I doubt myself and I think, you know, why do I keep trying to do things that are creative when I'm not? It, and it, it's funny, but, you know, most of it's gone, but that creeps in at times. But I have proof. I've got this beautiful statue, an Emmy, that says, <laughs> Tony, you're full of shit. <laughs> but, you know... <laughs> Even now, like I was just saying, that that creeps up at times. So I don't know if it ever goes away. I think it's it's how you perceive your situation and know to reel yourself back in to what you know better. And that's the reason for that. And then for that, yeah, I, I've come to the uh, realization that we can measure our progress along the spiritual path not by how many times we're triggered but by the speed of our recovery, coming back from the triggered response and coming back to center. As that gets faster and faster, then we start to real see the triggers getting further and fewer between and less in intensity and so on and so forth. But the beginning is the recovery time. And that all has to do with awareness, just becoming aware. Oh, there it is again. I thought I put a stake through the heart of that thing years ago, but here it is again. Okay, I know what to do. And we just do it. Or you don't, and you have a bad day. And then the next morning, you wake up, and you have a better day. Kind of like that. This next line is really good. He says, if we do not see what is in our reservoir. Okay, this is all the core, belief, the core beliefs he's talking about. We will understand all new things in the same old pattern way. That's not stuff not getting through the filter, right? If it doesn't get through the filter, then we're only going to understand what we think we already know. And nothing new will ever happen. A new idea held by the old self is never a really new idea. Whereas even an old idea held by a new self will soon become fresh and refreshing. Contemplation actually, actually fills our reservoir with clean, clear water that allows us to encounter experience free of old patterns. So that's the process. I um uh, in some of my readings I learned this technique where it says you know when we're unforgiving of ourselves oh I'm a failure I'm worthless I'm not creative it says turn it around and pretend it's your friend what will you tell your friend good one yeah and that helps because we all have these negative thinking it says but what would you tell your friend to encourage that friend or support that friend. And then you tell yourself, right? Right. right. Yeah. But you, but here, here's the thing. You can't do that if you're not aware in real time of what's actually going on. Because if you're not, then, as he said earlier, it, it's it's just just knee jerk response. How did he how did he put it? Uh, I can't remember now. Uh, maybe it was in the, in the next page. But he talks about the fact that it's just you're just going to be on the hamster wheel. You're just going to be, you know, just the pattern is going to represent itself and you won't even be aware that it's a pattern. It'll just feel like it's what's supposed to be happening right now. And so awareness is always going to be the key. When you can become aware, now you can think about what would I tell my friend under these circumstances and tell yourself the same thing. Now you can make a different choice. But without awareness, none of that happens. You are just a slave. You are just an automaton being uh, led around by your emotions. I'm, I'm struck by what 
by what Tony said, and uh, when he said he became when he got to was it your sophomore year in in high school? Is that what it was? Yeah. Then I woke. I started to wake up. Yeah. I was questioning at that point. Yeah, I didn't know. It was uh, my my experience was that I was always small. Um, you know, all the guys were getting big and getting big biceps, you know, and stuff tonight. And that wasn't my deal, but, <clears throat> but I, I excelled in, in, in athletics and, and, in and so I, I used both of those for myself. And I, I found that I found, I found that I was realizing some respect from others by the, by my ability to turn a double play on a baseball field hit a baseball with a bat uh, and also to, to sing a song. And I carried that over into when I got to college, that helped immensely um, in an introduction a little bit of martial arts, you know, for which I'm certainly no master, but uh, that introduction uh, was great help. Um, help those, those three things helped me to turn my, and I didn't realize at the time, but help me to turn the focus back into my into my good self, rather than saying, you know, um, I better get out of the street. I might get hurt. Um, the opposite was true. So, um, I mean, this is what that's what I'm reading reading into when he said, uh, he says, if we do not see what is in our reservoir. We will understand all new things in the same old pattern way, and nothing new will ever happen. A new idea held by the old self is never really a new idea, whereas even an old idea held by a new self will soon become fresh and refreshing. And that's what those that's what those activities did for me. And I, you know, I didn't, I was not, I would not have been able to, to. Uh, to pinpoint it in that in that um, in that regard back then, but that's exactly what happened for me. It's another example. I think you're hopefully getting the point. What's yeah. going on? Like in my the happiness is not dependent on what you think of me. You know. Yeah, we we therapists type have kind of tools in our toolbox where we talk about what's been spoken about doing maybe opposite action as a DDT form. So what would your actions be if you did believe this about yourself, you know, and with other people that I work with, you know, there's some deconstruction of, you know, I hate myself or I, you know, I'm no good. And then we would kind of dissect that and say, well, show me the proof, you know, and kind of decon help people deconstruct that but also you know and then there's the whole affirmation things that we see both in the 12-step program kind of like the acting as if and affirmations waking up and part of that you know and I used to when I was told to do that years ago I used to think why would I lie to myself every single day <laughs> you know but <laughs> then you see you get the neurology you know, the neural pathway piece of it and everything, you know, that, that kind of flies with some and not so much with others. And, you know, you got to be in a place to be able to kind of take that in. So there are techniques out there, but ultimately it's about paying attention. It's noticing, you know, kind of being a witness, stepping out of the emotional piece of being, I hate that saying, oh, kind of like getting what Dave is saying, kind of that, you know, observer part of you saying, oh, look at me. I'm back hating myself. I'm back not believing I'm creative today oh look at this and realize that it's got a beginning middle and end type of thing but um but it's kind of like also leaning into what the things that you're doing during the day that are um are counteracting that belief kind of leaning into what's right in the world or times that you felt loved you know who is loving you when your, your core belief is i'm unlovable well let's Let's talk about who who loves you. Do they just have poor taste or what? You know, what is it that they're loving about you? What do they see type of thing? And then, like Alan said, what would you, would you say that to a friend? And ultimately, you know, we know that we wouldn't say to our friends the things that we say to ourselves, you know, but it's got to come from a 
readiness, I think. I think there's a readiness for people to take it in. They could only kind of piecemeal it. It's not like they could take it in all at once. But um, but they have these corrective emotional experiences that hopefully build on each other. Well, William, that's that's great. So so here's the thing. Everything Danielle was talking about is the rational part of it. You know, it's mm -hmm. trying to crack through that that uh, that mindset with a rational argument, which opens the door. But actually, going through the door is going to be done physically, experientially. So once you get to the point where you're seeing the, the operation of these core beliefs and how they really don't hold any rational water, now you can start to act as if they are not true. Now you can start to ask as if the inverse is true. And doing that over time is what's going to make the difference. You know, if Tony had all these breakthroughs, but then never practiced his creativity, he wouldn't have that Emmy on his mantelpiece, right? And right. if John hadn't acted on his talents, um, then he wouldn't have gained the confidence or the ability to see that he didn't need the big biceps or whatever else he thought was missing, you know, that he could still be successful in life. It's the action that actually makes the difference. But if we don't have the awareness, which is what the therapy can give us, of what contemplation can give us, then we're never going to get the, get the experience. So the, the, the two work hand in glove. It's that whole idea, you know, do we act our way into right thinking or do we think our way into right acting? Well, really it's both, you know, but it's actually the action that's going to take us where we want. To. That's why faith is action. Faith isn't belief. It's not mental assent. You got to get that idea out of our heads. Faith, biblical faith, is acting as if something is true, even when we don't have the evidence. That's going to be the key. For me, because, can... I'm sorry, Jerry, go ahead. For me, what the turning point for me was when I found Al Anon and um, started actually working the program and studying the steps um, and hearing other people share um, and listening to their stories. Then it started giving me the awareness of my core beliefs. I like, oh, I didn't like myself before I started Al Anon. I really didn't. And through Al-Anon and through listening to other people and uh, working the steps and, and especially the first three, you know, came to believe in a power greater than myself. And I found a spiritual uh, path. And, and then when I heard things like doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, you know, and that's what I would do, you know, just, well, if I do it this way, it, you know, then this, you know, but yes, taking the action of actually writing the steps and writing what my feelings were and doing a fourth step inventory. And, and then I had to keep coming back because if I didn't keep coming back, then I would fall back into those old core beliefs that I was not good enough and that I didn't like myself. Um, so I had to, you know, for me, I have to keep coming back. I have to keep coming to things like tonight. Um, because if I don't, I'll fall back into those old beliefs. I don't think they ever totally go away, even though we're taking the steps and we're taking the action. At least not for me. I have to stay on top of it. Um, and then I got into meditation and contemplation and, you know, learned that there's even more things, you know, that I could do to get rid of some of those core beliefs. Today, I can say I like myself. And that I am good enough, and that I am a beloved child of God, and believe it, and truly, truly believe it. Um, where before I thought God didn't like me, didn't much less love me, you know. So it it was a long process, though. Always is, <laughs> and it's they, it's not uh, linear. You know, it's it starts and stops and circles around and all sorts of crazy stuff, but. Right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, William. I find myself thinking about like some shadow stuff. Um, so, for example, when Tony was talking about, you know, feeling helpless and feeling trapped, you know, on some level, there is a reality there that especially when you were younger, like that was the reality of you were helpless and trapped when you were being bullied, right? And that became part of this 
belief system and whatever the strategy is we came up with at 10 years old just ain't going to work when we're 50 right it's it's just right on it's not well thought out right <laughs> um, but even thinking about uh, who was just talking uh it was uh jerry um you know talking about you know core beliefs like i'm not good enough and things like that and you know if you're gonna get better you should believe you're not good enough, right? You you should believe, like, I'm not good enough is just a negative way of saying I need to improve, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, or I just want to be loved. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, but anyhow, I just find myself, like, thinking about, like, to piggyback on what um, Danielle was talking about earlier, but just to add a piece to that, which is this acceptance that, yeah, I am not good enough, right? Uh, I am powerless. I am helpless. I am, I need help. I need guidance, right? Um, you know, so there is some... I just think there's something there about some of those core beliefs that, yes, we need to bring an awareness to them and tease them apart enough to get a little freedom from them. But some of that, that internal critic, if you will, you know, every great person who has ever accomplished anything worth mentioning has got an internal critic that's unrelenting. Um, you know, so like the, the Tony talking about this creative piece, right? Every artist is not satisfied with their work. <laughs> right? Yeah, like, right on. Every great artist suffers with, and it's it just part of the package, right? It's you don't become a great artist if you're like, all right, that's good enough. Print, let's go. Um, you know, so I think all of that kind of stuff needs to blend together in some way. Yeah, you know, and, and William, I'll just put a shameless plug in also for Enneagram. I mean, I'm thinking about that the whole time we're talking about this because each of the numbers really has a core sort of core belief, a core fear, like a five, mm. the investigator, their fear is that they don't want to seem inadequate or seem like they don't know something. You know, that's a core belief. They might not be smart enough, you know, mm. or a two might believe something else. So a lot of this is tied into that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and so as long as you're aware, it's never going to go away. You're not really going to get rid of it. You just need to understand it, be aware of it, kind of get in the groove with it and say, this is what it is. So I just need to be aware of it so I can not react or react to it properly. You know, when I, when I come across a circumstance, that's going to make me feel a certain way. I mean, that's the whole game, right? Figuring out the awareness of what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do think we need to make a distinction here, and maybe that it can be clearly, most clearly seen in the difference between CBT and DBT. So CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, and DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy. But the real core difference between the two of them is that if you're practicing CBT, then what you're always aiming for is change. But if all the focus is on change, then what that's telling you is I'm not good enough as I am. And that's damaging to a lot of people that are trying to be improved through CBT. What DBD does brilliantly is to balance change with acceptance. The idea of radical acceptance in dialectical behavioral therapy is really important because what it's telling us is, yes, we are good enough. We are acceptable as we are, but we can be better and we can change. So we don't lose the divine dissatisfaction that William is talking about that motivation that keeps us wanting to become more and more excellent. But at the same time, we're not feeling that we, as we are, are unworthy or unacceptable or unlovable because it's so important for us to understand no matter how damaged we are, we are still lovable and acceptable, if not to anybody else, at least to God. That's foundational. We need to have that. 
And so our focus on change is on our behavior and the things that we do, um, which will make us better people. But we are still acceptable. And that's an important thing, I think, that, that Jesus is also trying to teach us as well about the nature of the Father's love. So, yes, we're focused on change. But at the same time, we got to silence the core beliefs that are telling us that we are not mm. good. Mm -hmm. Continues. I just have to say that he's oh. using the hot air balloon analogy because he's from Albuquerque and the hot air balloon <laughs> fiesta. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of hot air balloons down there. And Del Mar. <laughs> Del Mar has one too. <laughs> Here's the mistake we all make in our encounters with reality, both good and bad. We do not realize that it was not the person or event right in front of us that made us angry or fearful or excited and energized. At best, that is only partly true. You know, the idea so often, and, and any of you who have done counseling, you know, when people start talking about the issue, the issue is not the issue. The issue is only what triggered the deeper issue. We got to get down to the deeper issue. Or maybe it's the 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 negative side of what uh, Laura is talking about, the task within the task. You know, you get the surface task, the thing you're actually doing, but what's happening underneath is the connection that you're building with another person. You know, small talk is a task, but what's happening underneath is deeper connection. Same thing here. The issue is not the issue. So whether it's the hot air balloon that makes you feel good, well, no, you're predisposed to be moved by that hot air balloon because you allowed yourself to be present to it to let everything go and, and just be there and watch that thing with awe move up into the sky the way it does. So it's not the person or event right in front of us that makes us angry or fearful or excited or energized at best. That's only partly true. If you let that beautiful hot air balloon in the sky make you happy, it's because you are already predisposed. The hot air balloon just occasioned it. And almost anything else would have done the same. You know, a lot of times people will We'll uh, talk about how the effect or I or somebody else, you know, changed their life. And I like to tell them, you know what? Obviously, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I was the, the lucky guy to be the millionth person over your bridge to get the prize, you know, to be able to see the change in you. But if it hadn't been me, it would have been the next guy that came, the next woman who came, because you were ready. And then and the teacher will appear, just like the hot air balloon occasions the sense of joy and happiness. But we have to be ready. Daniel said the same thing. You've got to be ready for it. There's nothing that can make you ready. You can get pelted constantly by, by certain ideas and concepts, but until you're ready, until it starts to filter in, then you're just not going to be aware. You're just not going to be ready for it. When a student is ready, the teacher appears. Then he says, how we see will largely determine what we see and whether it can give us joy and make us pull back with an emotionally stingy and resistant response. So there's that how versus what again, you know, that we keep coming back to. God's will for our lives is how. It's a how, not a what. God isn't interested, I believe, in the details. Those are ours to choose, and they're arbitrary. We can find God on any path we take or any path we didn't take. We tend to think that there's one true path, one true soulmate, one true this or true that. The truth is, you know, whatever path we choose will equally present us with everything that we need to find the right how. It's the how that makes the difference. How we see will determine what we see without denying an objective outer reality. Now, this is important because what we're dangerously getting close to is a relativism that says there really is no objective reality. It's all what we see and hear. You know, we're going to be talking later about how it's up to us to make meaning in situations. Maybe the meaning isn't intrinsically just static in an event or a thing or a circumstance, but there is still objective reality. And he's stating this without denying an objective outer reality, what we are able to see and are predisposed to see in the outer world is a mirror reflection of our own inner world and state of consciousness at that time. Basically, that's how it works. We can only see what we're ready to see. We'll only see the teacher when we're ready to see the teacher. We'll only let them, the moment speak to us when we can truly be present to us, to it, when we're ready to be present. Most of the time, we just do not see at all, but rather operate on cruise control. 
Those are those conditioned responses that we were talking about that are, that are needed, you know, those evolutionary adaptations that allow us to develop quickly conditioned responses. We can categorize things, threat, friend, so that we can automatically respond right out of the limbic system. We don't even have to deal with all the thought processes that take as much time as we would be dead, right? But now we're working against those kind of conditioned responses. We're working against our evolution on a spiritual level to be able to get up on top of these core beliefs and allow ourselves to really connect with nature, each other, God's presence, so on and so forth. But otherwise, if we are not aware, we will be on cruise control. Stimulus response. Jesus, of course, was talking about this phenomenon in his famous line about calling out the speck in another Zion, not recognizing there's actually a log blocking our own. The log here equals our worldview. The log equals our core beliefs. The log equals the way that we see reality rather than reality itself. The log is the filter that we talk about. He taught this with great emphasis. Hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye first, but only then can you see clearly enough to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Our Buddhist friends have long called this log removal process lens wiping. And I suspect it is exactly what Jesus is referring to when he called us to change. And of course, the change here, the word that you will mostly see is repent. When he says Mark 1.15, that is, you know, the waiting is over, the kingdom is here, repent, you know, and, and hear the gospel. So that's the idea. Repentance is the idea of change, changing direction, changing the way that we think, changing the way that we behave. Repentance is this whole process we're talking about of being able to move past our conditioned responses and our capabilities. Hey, we actually got through what we pre-read. I like that. There's a symmetry there. Okay, last few minutes. What are you thinking? I'm thinking that I will um, have some of the things that you were talking about, about tonight because it, it I have to go over and over and over, um, you know, things to make it set. And all do, Linda. We all do. I'm sorry, what? We all do. We all do. It, it, oh. Just like Daniel was saying, it doesn't all come off at once. You're gonna you're gonna be peeling that onion for a long time. It's just the way it works. So don't worry about it. Be patient with yourself. Mm -hmm. Give yourself a break because this is the cost. I'm thinking how much my therapist mirrored everything we covered tonight. And I just saw her this morning, so. <laughs> <laughs> Serendipity, isn't that the word? I don't know. <laughs> Coincidence? Anyway. Well, I don't know, she, Ken. Uh, I don't know how much you're paying your therapist, but just send us the check next time. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> the insurance is paying her. The insurance is paying her. Get it for free here. <laughs> Uh, you're in good company <laughs> but isn't it great to get that corroboration right ken yeah enforcement. i mean this is it it's so good and typically that's the way it works when you're ready to start hearing you know you hear it you hear it again and you're sort of vaguely aware of it but when you hear it the third time it's like wait a minute that's what's now going on and that gives you the trend that's starting when you really start paying attention so watch for things happening in three because that's that's showing that your awareness is catching up to you. Hmm. There is that sense of your awareness having to actually catch up to you. And when it finally gets in real time, when you're aware hmm. of what you were thinking and saying and doing in real time, that's when you can make the different choice. And that's where the that's where the magic happens. You know, hmm. awareness, opposite action. But we can't do the opposite action until we're aware in the moment when the choice is being presented and the trigger as well. I really appreciate, I mean, to acknowledge what you said, Dave, is that the great old line that, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. That's so very true. And I appreciate mm -hmm. what you all had, had was sharing. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't realize that you were, you were part of the mob, the uh, mm -hmm. therapists. But yeah, <laughs> very cool. Yeah, but it's also what you said to me too. The teacher has always been there. 
Mm. Hmm. There are teachers all around us all the time, you know, but we'll only become aware of them when we're ready. I'm sorry, Gail. I'm so grateful that um, God knows when I'm ready, you know, <laughs> that, that he doesn't reveal the things that I really do need to hear all at once. Because, uh, yeah, I, I can't handle that. None of us can. <laughs> it would be Good overwhelming. Point. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Mm -hmm. Teaspoons full. <laughs> That's good. all right hey this is another good session thanks everyone and uh and thanks for all of the uh the stories from the past and the insights and your willingness to be vulnerable to the rest of us here and, and talk about some, some deeper things it's all good all right we'll pick this up next week where are you there you are scotty Thank you for this evening. Thank you for always being with us wherever we are and whatever we're up to. Loving us and putting an arm around us and occasionally correcting us when we need it. Or maybe more often than some. <laughs> Depends upon who I am at the time or what I'm playing around with. Lord, I just pray that you continue to draw us by your Holy Spirit and into all truth. It's what we're after, Lord. We want to know the truth about how things work and ways to build a better life and have better companionship and deeper meaning in our family and our relationships. And I know you know everything that we think we need as well as the things we actually do need. So we lovingly trust it into your care and loving hands. Thank you for everything you do in our lives and the way that you love us. It's in your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus, that we pray and we give our thanks and say our amens. Amen. Amen, everyone. Great night. Good night, everybody. Okay. Thank you. See you Sunday. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Jerry. Great seeing you. Bye, Jerry. So I have a question for Gil and Gail. Did you guys eat sizzle and lean? <laughs> that was my cousin that raised that. Oh, I didn't get any. You didn't have any. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's and juicy, really. I thought it was pretty good. Homegrown. <laughs> we we had a uh, um a neighbor across from us who had a. Pig? Pot belly pig. Pot belly pig. She came to our door and asked if we wanted it. And I was like, oh. <laughs> well, thank you. I think I made some comment about a Hawaiian barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that didn't go over very well. <laughs> I <don't think> so. <laughs> Underground and sizzle for 12 hours? Oh, my God. <laughs> Maybe. We've had really one of those. Good that way. A luau. Yeah. at a, a church in texas and it was awesome yeah, yeah. It's delicious. <laughs> all right we digress again <laughs> we digress again it doesn't take much and we're off somewhere out in the north 40 somewhere yeah the pig on Bye. Bye. Is that William? the pig on looney tunes his name was ham or pig Hamilton. Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton. I gotta go. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Yeah. Good night. Good night. See you on Bye. Sunday. Bye. Okay. See you guys on Sunday. Bye, Jordana. Bye, Linda. Sharon, are you still there? Uh, I am. I was about to click out. Well, good night, Sharon. Get some rest. Good night. You too. Okay. See you Sunday. Bye -bye.